All right, everybody, good evening to you all. We are in the final chapter of the book of Revelation. We have come to the end of the end. But we're going to begin at the beginning. So open your Bibles to Genesis chapter 2. Who said, uh-oh, was that Alex? Get out of here. You don't even go here. Genesis chapter 2. And you'll understand why uh, as we go through the last text of Revelation. But uh, we can either do this now or we can do it when we get to the actual chapter. But I'd rather just plant the seed now and then water it later in Revelation. So look at Genesis 2. Read with me verses 15 through 17. <clears throat> and the Lord God took the man, Adam, and put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat of it. For in the day that you eat thereof, thou shalt surely die. Jump down to chapter 3. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God said you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. And the serpent said to the woman, You shall not surely die. For God does know that in the day that you eat thereof, that your eyes will be opened, and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant for the eyes, and the tree desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also to her husband who was with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were opened, <coughs> excuse me, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Verse 8. And they, and they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam, said, and, excuse me, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked and hid myself. And God said, Who told you you were naked? I love that question. There's so much into it. We don't have time to get into it now. Have you eaten of the tree whereof I commanded you that you should not eat? And the man said, Well, the woman that you gave me, that was with me she gave me of the tree and i did eat and the lord god said to the woman what have you done and the woman said the serpent beguiled me and i did eat jump down to verses 22 through 24 and the lord god said verse 22 behold the man has become as one of us he's speaking to himself within his nature to know good and evil and now lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever therefore the lord god sent him forth from the garden of eden to till the ground from whence he was taken so he drove out the man and placed in the east of the garden cherubim and a flaming sword which he turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. That is to say, to keep man out of access to the tree of life. All right, a text we're very familiar with. That's just a quick summary of it. But I want to just pose this question for you to stew over, and I may end up just answering it as I start talking. But to think about this as we go through this final chapter of Revelation, um, what specifically, and your Bible specifically tells you, so this is not speculation, what specifically is the reason that Moses gives as he writes the words of God? And he gives you the thought process of the divine. What specifically is the reason that God says, you know what, we've got to get man out of this garden? The answer is not simple as just, well, they sinned, and so they had to be punished by leaving the garden. Because that was not the punishment that God promised man. The punishment that God promised man, as we read in Genesis 2, was death, not exile from the garden. Okay, and specifically, specifically, capital punishment. I will put you to death. I will do you murder. I will put you down. Death. Why didn't they die? Because Jesus died for them and God knew that would happen. But that's a whole different thing. We'll study that in questions and answers time. Or maybe in the fundamentals class after that. But still, that's the idea, okay? If it wasn't to punish man. There was another reason that Moses specifically writes, and he writes it there at the end of Genesis 3. It was that God said within himself that if we don't do anything... If we don't, if we, the tri triune nature of God, if, if God, Godhood does not intervene, then man who has now sinned and now lives in rebellion against God, if he remains in the garden, will have access to the tree of life in the garden and will live forever in rebellion to God. And what God will not have is someone living perpetually in rebellion. God's nature compels him to separate from himself those who are in error, those who are sinful. The reason hell is, is for that very purpose. And so God knew within himself and within his nature and the way that he reconciles to himself the concept of sin with his perfect holiness. He knew he had to do something because he could not allow man 
to remain in the garden wherein is the tree of life to live forever in open rebellion to him. And so man had to leave the garden. Man had to leave specifically the tree of life. Now from that point on, all the way up until Revelation chapter 21 verse 27, you have been reading the story of man trying to get back into that garden trying to get access once again to that tree of life, trying to live forever again. Except forever again with God again. With God, in a fellowship with God, trying to get back not just into the place, but try to get back into the position that Adam and Eve were in before the devil crept in and tempted them and caused them to sin and lose their relationship with God. A relationship that God could not allow to stay in that condition with man living forever. And so... Without Christ having yet died, man and God must continue to be spiritually separated and physically must be separated by leaving the tree of life and the Garden of Eden. And so from that point in Genesis all the way up until Revelation, you are reading the book of, of the Bible. You are reading the story, for lack of a better, of man trying to get back to having a relationship with God again so that we could have the right to pluck from the tree of life and live forever with God again. And what's amazing about the Bible is man is helped along the way. And that's, that word does not do it justice. Man is given the freebie along the way to have that access again by the very God who denied him the right to enter in the first place. And the way that was done was through Christ on the cross and his resurrection. As you read the Bible, it, it, the, the Bible is 66 individual volumes. Okay, It is 66 it's of its own narratives. So it's, it does it a disservice to call the Bible a story, singular, or even 66 stories, plural. But just for lack of a better, think of the Bible as one narrative, as one story. Like all good stories that are written, it has a three-act structure. In the middle of the second act, you have the turning point moment. You have, uh, you, you have they find Princess Leia, but then they have to go on the run in the middle of the Death Star. You have that moment where everything has to pivot. Everything changes. Right? You have the introduction, you have the heroes go off on the quest, and there's something out of a twist. And then after the twist, you have the change that causes everybody to reevaluate, to get out of the predicament that they're in, and then rush to the finish in Act 3. That's, that's your, that's your three-act structure that every story has. Your Bible, if it was laid out that way, its beginning is, is Genesis. Its beginning is just three little chapters of one book of 66 books. Your beginning ends in Chapter 3 of Genesis. The middle point, the turning point, the pivot point is the cross and the resurrection that follows. It's at that point when everything in humanity that we had unable to have access to becomes available to us. And from that point until here in the end of Revelation, you are reading the story of how and why we have access to the tree that we lost back then. All right, now I'm, I, all I just did there for the past seven minutes was just plant some seeds. As we go through Revelation 22, we're gonna let John in the last chapter water those seeds and let them sprout, okay? Go to Genesis 22. Where we are and where we were in the previous chapter 21 is getting an apocalyptic look at glory beyond this world. Post-judgment glory, all right? But I'm choosing my words carefully because as I said before and I'll say again, we're not reading about heaven per se. We are reading about the church. We are reading about the body of Jesus' people. We are reading about the collection of the saved as we are without having to worry about Satan mucking it all up as he did starting in the, in the garden. Genesis 22, 1. And he showed me, the angel showed John, a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and the throne of the Lamb. The throne of God and the Lamb. The throne of both of them. Again, we're not describing heaven. We're describing the church post-judgment day. The distinctions are minor but critical as we go through this. I'll make reference to them. But what does he see here? He's already seen several things in the previous chapter. But look at what he sees in verse 1. He sees a pure river, a river of a special kind of water, a river flowing with the water of life. That makes now three things in Revelation that have that qualifier of life attached to them. We read earlier in this book about the overcomers of Jesus eating from the tree of life. Chapter 2, verse 7, the same tree of life that was once in the Garden of Eden. We learn that the overcomers will have their names etched in the book of life. Chapter 3, verse 5. And now here we read of the water of life. But that's not a new idea. That's not a Revelation exclusive idea. Jesus, among other people, talk about the water of life. Jesus in John chapter 4 introduces to the Samaritan woman the prospect 
of the water of life, which she can enjoy through salvation that he offers. This river of the water of life, because of what, it's water, uh, what kind of water it is, what the water has in it, because of where the water is located, it is naturally, obviously described as being without fault. It is clear as crystal. There's no dirt in it. There's no impurities in it. There's no worms in it. It's pure, clear. And it flows directly out of the throne of God. We don't have time because we have one class left. I want to get this done in this week. But there's a whole chapter of Ezekiel. There's a whole prophecy of Ezekiel of the temple. After he prophesied the temple being destroyed, he sees the temple being restored and the river of life flowing out of it. And that is all a big illusion and allegory of the kingdom of the Messiah to come. But you'll take my word for it. I'll teach you Ezekiel someday. But that's the same metaphor here. He sees this water. And where is this water flowing from? Rivers in the natural world flow from mountains. Glacial deposits in the top of the mountains, they melt, they, they run down to streams, become rivers. Well, this doesn't flow from a mountaintop, it flows from a throne top. It flows from the top of the crown of God and outward. Verse 2. And in the midst of the, the King James says, street of it. And your Bible might even say street or road or pathway. And which might make you think, oh, we're talking about the city. Cities have streets, but that's not this word. This word just means the wideness of it. In the middle of the wideness of it, what's it? It is the river we're talking about. In the midst of the river and on either side of the river, there was the tree of life, which bore 12 manners of fruits and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were of the healing, sorry, were for the healing of the nations. Now try to visualize this because it's kind of hard to wrap your mind around. Once again, what does John say that he saw? He saw a river, okay, going to fade i hope you can see it and he says in the midst of the wideness of the river that's your literal translation not in the middle of the street which that wouldn't make sense either but none of this makes sense the streets are gold so let's just let's not worry about that the point is though in the middle of the wideness of the river john says i saw that which we once had and lost and now we found it again i saw what the tree of life and where is the tree of life located specifically it is located in the midst of of the river you got that i don't know if you can see it way back there it's faded colors in the middle of the river is the tree this tree is growing out of the river of life and since this is the tree of life it makes sense that they would not be detached but connected so gr gr growing and coming out of the river of life is the tree of life but even more bizarrely is the description of it look specifically at what it says in verse 2 in the middle of the wideness and on either side of the river was the one tree of life now, does, does, I don't want to make sure we have a discrepancy. Hopefully we don't. Does anybody's Bible say trees, plural? Okay, good, because there's just the one of them, okay? In the middle of the river is the one tree of life. The one tree that was in the Garden of Eden is now located in the glorified kingdom. The one tree is not just in the middle, but is on either side of the river, which means the plumage, the branches, the wideness of the tree how far it expands, it expands to either side so that those on either side of the river can enjoy the fruit thereof. A fruit that we read blossoms every single month. And not just that, but its leaves fall, and the King James says, for the healing of the nations. The nations are already defined for us in the apocalypse as the people of God. The people of God are the ones that are in the city, the people of God are the ones that are drinking from the river of life. The people of God are the ones that are eating from the tree, uh, the fruit of life, that provides the eternality. But then when the leaves fall, now just pause right there. John says, I saw, well, he didn't say he saw, but he just by inspiration knows, that the leaves, when they fall from the tree, they symbolize something. Now think about this. When you see leaves on a normal tree fall, that is a clue that you're in the season of, are you ready for this? Fall, yeah, autumn, but fall is funnier. Because they leaves, the leaves fall. And when leaves fall from the tree, that's a sign that the tree is shriveling within itself, going into hibernation. It's going to not die. They don't die. They kind of go to sleep for the wintertime and then come back, wake up in the springtime. And the leaves falling symbolizes this tree is not going to do anything for you for the entire winter months. While it's cold, this tree is not providing anything. But this tree has already been defined for us as providing year-round. So why is it dropping its leaves? So the leaves dropping of this tree is not a symbol of its, of its ever-withering. 
It's never going to shrivel. It's never going to hibernate. It's never going to be unavailable to you to enjoy from at any point throughout the metaphorical year. What do its leaves therefore represent? Well, the text tells you it represents the healing of the nations, the healing of the people who enjoy the tree. Now, there are two ideas given to you there. Look at them as one. You have the fruit of life, which you eat from and you live, and you have the leaves that provides you healing. In other words, you have leaves of healing and you have a tree of life that are available every month. Life and healing together, I'm not gonna write it, eternality. Life and healing is living forever. What did man have in the Garden of Eden? Living foreverness. You stay there, I'll be here, God says. We'll walk together, we'll live together, and you will forever live because you will forever eat from this tree. Its leaves will forever heal you. You will always be perpetually refreshed and reinvigorated to live forevermore. Life and healing is eternity. And that's what this tree provides. That's what you're reading about. It's that tree. It's the tree from Genesis 2. Like the, it's, it's the Holy Grail. But it's not the Holy Grail, because that doesn't matter. There was no such thing. There was no cup that caught the blood of Christ. That's just, that's just a myth that Indiana Jones chase after and the Roman Catholics believe in. The real idea behind the Holy Grail is you drink from the Holy Grail and you live forever. Why would I want to live in this stinking world forever? No, the real eternal life is spiritual eternal life. What you get when you eat from this spiritual tree and you drink from this spiritual water and you get the healing from these spiritual leaves is living foreverness of a spiritual kind. Keep going. Verse 3. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb, that's one throne for the God and the Lamb, shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him in and around this tree. The, the river flows out of the throne. The tree rises out of the river. It's all one big connected thing. And who surrounds this tree? The servants of God. The, uh, does your Bible say curse? I'm curious. At the beginning of verse 23, what is the curse? We read this in Genesis 2. You may eat from any tree that you want except for that one tree right there. In fact, I'll, I'll put it right in the middle, in the middle of the garden. Don't eat from that tree because the day that you do, you will be cursed with the curse of death. Now those who eat from it shall have no more curse because to eat from this, this tree is to give you life, not death. The curse is death. And now that the devil's out of the picture, now that death itself has been chucked into the river of fire or the lake of fire, remember we read that a couple of chapters ago, now that death itself is out of the picture, all that remains is life. We're free of the curse. I want to read you a verse from Zechariah chapter 14. And Zechariah is prophesying in verse 11, or all of chapter 14, about the coming era of the Messiah. All right? In the middle of that chapter, I wish I could study all of it, but just this one verse, Zechariah says, and men shall dwell in it, it being the restored Jerusalem of the Messiah. He's visualizing the kingdom of Christ. Men shall dwell in it, and there shall be no more utter destruction, the King James says. There shall be no more dying and decaying and withering away, the word means, to nothingness. But Jerusalem shall be safely inhabited. In other words, Zechariah the prophet envisions the coming era of the Messiah, when the new holy city of the Messiah, the new Jerusalem of the Messiah, will have its inhabitants who will live in that new holy city forevermore, never wasting away, never being utterly destroyed, where you just you wither and you die and you go and you become dust and you just, you're gone, physically speaking. That won't happen in this new Jerusalem. Well, it just so happens in this very book, in the previous chapter, where it's identified for us where we're located right now, and it was the new Jerusalem. The same thing that Zechariah was seeing. But remember, Zechariah was prophesying the church. What he's prophesying for you is your spiritual abode right now. Not the state of Arkansas, not this world. The spiritual place in which you are in fellowship with God. The new Eden, the new Jerusalem. Wherein right now you partake of eternal life. But I'm getting ahead of myself. What do people do according to this verse? Uh, Revelation 22, 3. There's no curse. Instead, the throne in the, of God and the Lamb surround and His servants serve. What are we going to be doing post-judgment? Are we going to be sitting on white clouds playing harps all day long? Polishing halos over our heads? No. We're going to be serving. We're going to be working. And there's a precedent for that because when God made Adam and put him in the garden, He did not tell him, just sit there on the stump 
I'll hang out with you in a little bit. We'll just shoot the breeze. No, God made Adam to serve and to tend and to work in the garden, which is why it was such a heartbreaking thing when Adam's punishment when he left the garden was that he would continue toiling in the ground, but he would now do so with sweat and with labor and with an aching back, something he would not have when he had leaves of healing. And so that's what we get now, a new kind of service, a happier, blissful kind of service. Verse 4, and they, they being us, the servants who are around this throne and around this tree and so forth, they shall see his face. Remember, he just mentioned the throne of God and the Lamb. And we will see his face and his name will be in our foreheads. The overcomers, that's us, the people who partake of the fruit of life, who get the refreshment from the leaves, the leaves of healing, who drink from the water of life, who surround the throne of God, we will look up and we will see that which no man has seen at any time. John chapter 1. That which is only revealed to us through the medium of the Son, John says. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father. He has declared the unseeable God. Remember what Paul writes in 1 Timothy 6.16. He says, of the glory and the majesty of God, the light of Christ, which he, that Christ now dwells in, the light and the glory and the majesty of God. It is a light which no man has seen, which no man can see, and which no man has dare approached. The, the utter magnificence of God's majestic glory is beyond our ability to appreciate. It's beyond our ability to stand in the, bas in the basking of. And yet here, John adds to 1 Timothy 6.16, that light which no one can approach, which no one can see, which no one has seen, John then says, but you're gonna. You will one day when you eat from this tree and you enjoy these leaves of healing because we're the people with his name written on our foreheads, with his ownership carved into our minds. He's mine. Verse 5. And there shall be no night there, and they'll need no candle, neither the light of the sun, for the Lord God gives them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. Very similar to what we read in the previous chapter, 21, 23. There's no night, there's no need for the sun or the moon, uh, there's no light, I should say, and there's no need for the sun or the moon because God is the light and so forth, uh, and it shines forever. Similar here, but there's some, there's some little differences and some different uh, thoughts added onto it. So look again at the text, verse five. There is no night there, and they need no candle. There are no dark places. There are no corners. There's no under the beds. There's no crevices. There's no places for bad guys to hide. There's no need where you need to creep somewhere with a light separate from the surrounding light because it's just light everywhere because you're in a place that is wholly occupied by the being who is light. So there should always be light everywhere. So you need no candle, neither the light of the sun, because the Lord God gives you all the light that you need. And they shall reign forever and ever. This is said to a people who, as it is being written, are being hunted down and slaughtered by the Pope. Uh, the Pope. <laughs> by the, the Caesar, I should say. They're being, I don't know why that came to my mind. Maybe. No, let's not go there. They're being hunted down and slaughtered by the Caesar, by the Roman emperor, okay? So they're constantly under the threat of tomorrow. They're constantly, their eyes, one eye is, yeah, wants to be in heaven, but one eye is always just down a little bit, just looking at the next day or looking at the next moment because they don't know when the next centurion is going to come knocking on their door to arrest them for declaring their faith in Christ. So it is a huge deal that Revelation is such a big picture thing that it doesn't just dwell on, it doesn't just dwell on, don't worry, Rome will be taken care of. That's a core part of the book. But it's also the bigger picture promise that one day you will not only survive Rome, you will not only resist Rome, but you'll take their jobs. They're reigning over you right now, but one day you will reign. It's very important that the Bible makes that distinction because it's being written to a people for whom reigning is the last thing on their mind. What they're thinking about is just surviving. Natural human tendency is just a thing about getting through the next day, just enduring, just scraping by. But God is not interested in his followers just scraping by. The reward of God is not just enough. The reward of God is not just getting enough to get by. The reward of God is boundless. The reward of God is not just survival. The reward of God is you reigning like a king with your proverbial boot on the proverbial neck of your proverbial enemies, or your literal enemies. That's the message here at the end of Revelation. It is of absolute victory, 
of total triumph. It's not about, oh, I can't wait to get vengeance. It's not about, oh, I can't wait to, to put my boot down on their throat. It's not, that's the wrong attitude. It's just about flipping the script 100%. Right now, they are crushing you, but one day you will crush them. That's the message. And he said to me, verse 6, These sayings are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show unto his servants the things which must shortly be done. The angel who's been with John since roughly the beginning of chapter 21, around 8 or 9 or so, verse 8 or 9, he tells the angel, uh, he tells the apostle, essentially, the vision's almost over. Revelation's almost done. The book and the notion. So what better way to start the conclusion than with this divine promise? Everything that you've just heard comes from the God who is faithful and true, who keeps his promises and who is reliable to do so forevermore. And the things that you read must, the King James says, shortly be done. That's not to say they'll happen next week. That's not to say they'll happen tomorrow. It's to say when they happen, they'll happen like that. They'll happen quickly. So fear not. You are not finished. You're not defeated. Rome is. They just don't know it yet. You hang on. You endure. You'll survive. And one day God's judgment will come down. And you'll be on the right side of it. And with that being said, with this angel declaring God is faithful and true and these things that you read about must shortly come to pass as if his ears were burning, Jesus speaks in verse 7. And he says, Behold, I come quickly. And there's no, and then I heard the voice of the Lord. There's no, and then I looked and beheld and there was Jesus. There's none of that. He just is suddenly speaking and you just know. Not because you cheat and you have a red letter Bible and so you know. Because we'll get to that in a second. Some of that's actually wrong, the red letter stuff. But because it's just, it's just you get the vibe. Of, of course it's Jesus speaking. Uh, because of what is said, it just feels right that he would just interject suddenly. Because he just got through saying, Jesus will come suddenly. And just to remind you of that, boom, suddenly he's talking. Like there's no cue, there's no warning. Isn't that just perfect? Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keeps the sayings of the prophecy of this book. To, to the reader who reads these words originally, to the first century Christian under persecution, blessed is he that survives, blessed is he that endures, because then he'll get more than survival, he'll get great triumph in the end. To the Christian reading it 2,000 years later, who are dealing with our own persecutions and our own problems of a different sort, lesser, greater degrees, it doesn't matter, our own problems that are big and important to us, to those of us who survive, we will be blessed, and we will survive, and we will endure, but only if we keep the sayings of the prophecy of this book. What's the prophecy of this book? The faithful will make it. The unfaithful will not. That's it in a nutshell. Verse 8. And I, John, saw these things, and I heard them. And when I had heard and seen, that is everything that he had recorded thus far, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel who showed me these things. What are you doing? This is the second time he's done that. And I can't be too bad, too hard on him because I've never stood next to an angel and saw the visions that Jonas saw. And it's very likely that if I had, I would have melted into a puddle as well. And I probably would have tried to worship the first thing I could see that looks somewhat radiant. And that's what this angel looked like. He's glowing, he's radiant, he's got heavenly aura. And so I've seen all this, and John now for the second time, after he got rebuked for it already in chapter 19, he sees all this and he falls down to worship the angel. And the angel has to say, what are you doing, my guy? We don't do that here. We don't worship angels here. There's only one king. To worship. I can't be too hard on him. It's, this is technically blasphemy, but, you know, we all move on from it very quickly in the book, so no hard feelings. It's understandable, is all I'm saying, why he would do it. And if I was there, I probably would do it too, even as John does twice. Either way, he sees all this, he hears all this, he falls down to worship the angel, verse 9, and the angel says, the King James says this, see thou do it not. That's very nice. Hey, let's not do that. Please get up, okay? I am a fellow servant. And of thy brethren the prophets, and of them which keep the sayings of this book. And then de declarative uh, uh, statement, worship God. That's who you worship, not the angels. Do not worship angels. They are servants, just like you and me. The angel is not saying he is one of the prophets. He's saying he's on the same level of the totem pole as the prophets and the apostles. He is just a messenger delivering the message. Don't worship the messenger. Don't shoot the messenger, but certainly don't worship the messenger either. Verse 10, and he said to me, now, way back in chapter 10, 
John saw a vision of uh, 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 a lot of spectacular things. And then he heard the voice of God as the voice of seven thunders. And the voice of God said to John, hey, seal that up. Don't write that part. You just heard a bunch of stuff, but don't write that down. All right. Frequently in apocalyptic writing, Old Testament, New Testament, the writer occasionally will, will see something grand or hear something spectacular. And he'll start transcribing and they'll come to a little section where God or an angel will interject and say, don't write that part. Don't record that part. That's just for you. That's not for now. That's, that's not for them to know yet. We'll get to that later. It's some other inspired writer or whatever. And so that's almost like what you're building up to here, except the table's flipped. We're here, John is told, don't seal this up. Do write this. This part needs to be proclaimed. What does he say in verse 10? Seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book. Why? Because the time is at hand. Everything that you've been writing about, John, is about to start happening. Because what's John been writing about? He's not writing about the era of Charlemagne. He's not writing about the fall of Napoleon. He's not writing about the rise of Hitler. He's writing about the end of the empire of Rome. So that thing is shortly about to come to pass. So the brethren who are going to be reading this letter need to know it. So write it. Deliver it. Send it out. Makes no sense when brethren, and non-brethren especially, try to interpret this book as a book of prophecies about the 20th century. Like I get it. You grew up in the 20th century, so you're biased, but it's just one of 20 centuries. Why is that one so special? Was Hitler that impressive? No, there'll be some other Hitler, I'm sure, in a decade or two in the 21st century. We'll get our own, you know. It's just, we think and assume because we live there and so much happened there, we think, well, Revelation must have been about that. Well, what did the people in the 19th century think? Did they just miss the boat? What are the people in the next 20 years going to think? Did they just miss the boat? Why is it the 20th century so special? It wasn't that special. The music was all right, but that's about it. So no, it was about what the people would have understood, what the people needed to hear. And what those people needed to hear was, your enemy, Rome, will be done away with. Application, application, application. Whatever century you want. But this is for the core audience, so don't seal this up. It's, con it's going to come to pass shortly, and that segues into verse 11. And he that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy... Let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. Does your Bible say still, S-T-I-L-L? -L? Or does it say from henceforth? I wouldn't say henceforth, I guess. Come on. Okay, so the idea is post-judgment, you're locked in, okay? There, there, is, no, there is no second chance or third chance, or fourth chance, your, your, your 50th chances are now, here and now, in this world. But once Judgment Day arrives, and you get your verdict, and you are separated as a sheep or a goat, that's it, there's no take backs. There, there's no mulligans, there's no one more tries, there's no more lives, that's it, you're done, you're locked in. And that's the idea behind this. These things are going to shortly come to pass, God's judgment is going to start being doled out. And once God's judgment is finished, that's it. Those who are unjust will forever be unjust. This verse is not saying that there are people who are bad and will always be bad and they're never going to change. I, I assume that's, that's true of some people because they're hard-hearted, but that's not what this verse is saying. This verse is not saying there are some people who have been preordained or predestinated to be unjust or to be filthy or to be holy or to be clean. And so they will forever be that. That's not what this verse is saying. This verse is saying there is a cutting off point where what you chose to be, you will forever be punished or blessed as. That's the idea behind the verse. He that is unjust will be unjust. He that is filthy, unclean, will forever be unclean. But he that is righteous, after this point, will be righteous. He that is holy will remain holy. So if you are unjust after judgment day, you will be unjustified, unsaved by God's grace because you chose not to take advantage of the here and now offering of God's invitation. If you're filthy, at that point, you'll forever be stained by the sin which separated you from Christ. And you'll be unrepentant and unredeemed forevermore. If you're righteous, and then that, when that day passes, you will forever be right in the sight of God. And right in the sight of God. And if you're holy, you'll forever be set apart from the sinful world. Never to be tempted by it. Never to be hurt by it. Never to be persecuted by it or condemned with it. Judgment day is the great locking in day. So whatever your spiritual position is, you chose that position. Joshua 24, 15 Choose whom you will serve. Choose God or choose everything else. And whatever you choose, accept the consequences of it. Now, 
Here's the way I want to interpret that. Before the cross, all right? Before the cross, everybody had sinned. We're all in agreement, other than Jesus, who is the, the grand exception to the rule for that very purpose of the cross. Other than that, we all have sinned. That doesn't mean that everyone had to sin. Not everyone was made to sin. Everyone chose to sin. We all chose to follow after the pattern of the first Adam who chose to sin. So let's not use the word had to or, cho or made to. Let's use the word inevitable. Okay, For all people on this side of the cross, your becoming a sinner was inevitable. It was going to happen. You chose for it to happen, but in the all-seeing eye of God, he foresaw everybody sinning. He just he knew it was going to happen, and so it happened. Okay? He didn't cause it. I have to keep clarifying because there's somebody out there who will say, All right, what did you say? No. He didn't make it happen. You chose it to happen. He just knew it was going to happen. All right? That's before the cross. Since the cross, we'll go ahead and do that just for convenience. Since the cross, all right, there is now the choice where you can either be redeemed or you can be unredeemed. Okay? And these two people are constantly living with each other because we're in this world with them. Spiritually, we're separated, but physically, they're with us. They're tempting us. We're surrounded by sin and the opportunity to go back into sin. But what the cross does is it provides for us a way out of the inevitable because here we are now living in the era of the post-cross world. And all of us have sinned, have we not? We still all have sinned. But if there was no cross, there would be no redemption. All would be condemned. What the cross does, it provides for us a chance to choose not to be condemned. It provides for us the option to choose whom we will serve. To serve God or to serve the devil. Because before, we're all serving the devil. We're all shackled. We're all condemned. We're all imprisoned to the devil, the warden. But through Jesus, the key has been turned, the shackles have been loosened, and we can walk away. For convenience sake, we'll draw a cross again because that's how we think of Jesus. When Jesus re re returns, second coming, there is no more choice. Now you're judged by your choices. And now, forevermore, there's a separation of sheep from goats. Separated in all concepts of separation. Physical, spiritual, emotional, whatever. All the righteous go with Christ. All the unrighteous go with the devil, separated forevermore. Be without Jesus, before Jesus, your being a condemned person was going to happen. The devil's too good at his job. The only one who managed to avoid it was the one who started out in heaven and has a new, knew the stakes. He avoided it. He became the redeemer. He became the one to give you the choice. And now since then, those who are evil will remain evil. Those who are righteous will will remain righteous. What I'm trying to get you to see is without Christ, there is no those who are holy. That doesn't exist. That concept is gone. That was gone in Eden. Get out. You don't get the tree. You sinned. You ate the forbidden fruit. Now everybody, everybody is wicked. And without Jesus, we would be wicked still. Everybody's filthy. And without Jesus, we would be wicked still. What Jesus does in the right now period is he gives you the chance to choose. Do you want to stay wicked or do you want to be righteous? Now you can choose righteousness. Isn't that an amazing thing? And when he returns, your choice is locked in and you're separated forevermore, either from him or with him. That makes sense? That's the meaning behind verse 11. Verse 12. And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give every man according to his work, excuse me, according as his work shall be. This is Judgment Day summarized. I am coming quickly. I'm coming unexpectedly. I'm coming suddenly. I'm coming surprisingly. And I'm coming with a reward to give to everyone as he has worked for that reward. Does that mean you work your way to heaven? No. It means you work on your way to heaven. And if you don't work on your way to heaven, then you're derelict and you're not going to get your reward. If you want your reward, you must put in the work. The work doesn't earn you salvation. You get the reward because you put in the work. God defines the terms, not us. And I'm coming, he says, to give you that reward quickly. But how quickly is quickly? Noah 
said, there's a flood coming. And then for a hundred years, he's building that boat. Looked like a giant coffin on water. He's building that big thing. And he's telling everybody, you guys are going to want to get in this because I know you've never seen water fall from the sky, but it's going to happen. I swear it's going to happen. I promise it's going to happen. And everyone laughs because water doesn't fall from the sky. Water comes up from the ground, silly. That's all they ever knew. And so he preaches this impossible message to this hard-hearted people while he's building this ridiculous thing, and nobody believed it for a hundred years. And then the rain started falling, and it happened suddenly. It came quickly. And the moment the first drop fell from the sky, I guarantee you those hard-hearted people thought, okay, I better get in that boat, and it was too late. Those who were wicked were wicked forevermore. Those who were righteous, Noah his wife, his three sons, and their wives, the only ones he converted, they were in the boat. They were righteous still. That's the, the, that's the analogy. There's no second chances once judgment starts. Your second chance time is now. Verse 13. I am Alpha and Omega, Jesus says. The beginning and the end. The first and the last. Who is Jesus to be our judge? What gives him the right to make the de declaration of who is righteous and who is unrighteous. How does he have the credentials to sit at that judgment seat and declare a sheep or a goat to be such? Well, he gives you his credentials in verse 13. I am Alpha and I am Omega. And then he clarifies what that means. I am beginning and I am ending. I am first and I am last. Alpha, Alpha, as you know, probably, is the first letter of the Greek alphabet. Omega, last letter of the Greek alphabet. So beginning and ending, first and last. Okay, fine. But A, the, the prefix, alpha as a prefix, as a letter you put before a word. Like, for example, a person who believes in God is a theist, right? From theos, meaning God in the Greek. But if you're an atheist, you're a non-believer in God. A person who is typical right, is a person that's common or ordinary, a person who is atypical is someone who is uncommon or, or not ordinary, right, so we carry that over into English, but it came from the Greek, that's the way the Greeks do words, they have a core word and they attach a different beginning or ending to change the meaning depending on what they need, so when you put a in front of a word, you negate that word, Jesus, God, the concept of God, did not begin with the beginning, because there is no beginning with God, the beginning began when God began it, God was already in the beginning when the beginning began because he's the one who began the beginning. You got me, right? That's God. So it's not like God started, God started with the beginning. No, God started the beginning. He, he predates the beginning. He is a beginning. He's a beginning. He's before the beginning. So if anybody is qualified to judge me, it's the one who has been there before I ever was a thing to be judged. And he is also the ending. In the Greek, if you put the omega letter at the end of a verb, you ascribe to that verb a continuous action. Like, for example, the Greek word, oops, pistuo, pistuo, or pistis, or, or pistu, and then whatever the ending is, that means faith, to have faith in something. Well, you can have faith in something one time, or you could pistuo, but the omega at the end of the word means to continually believe. That's Mark 16, 16. The King James does it like this, he that believeth and is baptized. People always make fun of the King James. They always make fun of Shakespeare. And they put THs at the end of the totally inappropriate words, and it makes me crazy, because Shakespeare didn't talketh like thisith. That's not how that works. It's a verb that gets a TH. And a verb only gets a TH if you mean for that verb to continually happen. He that continually believes and is baptized shall be saved. He that continually believes and is baptized shall be saved. This is what salvation looks like to God. A person who believes and believes and believes and is baptized and believes and believes and believes. That's salvation. It's not grammatical and it's not scriptural to say he that has believed and has been baptized. That's what the New American Standard says very incorrectly. Because that's not the commandment. The commandment is keep on believing and along the way be baptized because that's also a command and you'll be saved. So to put an omega at the end of a verb is to put a continuous action. Now here's the meaning behind this. I am the alpha and omega. I am that which negates anything before and I am that which keeps on going. The beginning and the ending. I am all the way till there is no end. I just keep on going, and I was there before there was a beginning to begin. Alpha and Omega. I'm the negating, and I'm the ever going. The first and the last. That's his credentials. That makes him qualified to call you a sheep or a goat. 
Now verse 14. I'm going to read it from the King James. The King James says this. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life and enter in through the gates into the city. If you have a cheater Bible, if you have a red letter edition Bible, is, is this verse 14 in red letters in your Bible? Who, does anybody, who has a red letter Bible? Anybody? Excellent. Who has, who has um, red letters in this verse? Anybody? You have it? What translation are you using? NIV? Anybody, anybody have a red letter Bible where this is not in red letters? Alex? Okay. Alex, does your Bible say something to the effect of wash their robes? Okay. Remember a few weeks ago I did the sermon on the Bible? And we had those two collections of manuscripts from which we get all of our translations. There's the Textus Sinaiticus, which came from Sinai. We found it in the 1800s. It's older, but it was found more recently. And there's the Textus Receptus, which means received text, which we have been using for longer, but it's actually a newer collection of manuscripts. And the rule of thumb with the manuscript is the older it is, the more accurate it is, because there's fewer opportunities for someone to forget to dot an I or cross a T along the way. So the older, the better. There are... There are two different uh, uh, sentences in the original language, depending on which manuscript collection that you use, Sinaiticus or Receptus, okay? I'm gonna, you don't have to read Greek or speak Greek. It doesn't matter. I'm just going to put the characters on the board for you to look at and see how similar they are and how minor distinctions can change the meaning entirely, okay? Textus Receptus looks like this. All right? Textus Sinaiticus looks like this. All right, very similar. Distinctions are, let's see, where was it? Um, here, wait, this should be, my bad, y'all. O, I, O, there. Here is a distinction, and I wrote the same one twice because I'm a dummy. Here is a distinction. One has an epsilon, one has another sigma, one has an omega, iota omega, one has a lambda, uh, um, upsilon. That's it, which is, the, which is the grammatical equivalent. Oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take longer. I don't care. You can leave if you want. It's the grammatical equivalent of dropping an L in, in a 2L word, okay? But it completely changes what the word says. In the text of Sinaiticus, it says, blessed are they that wash their robes. In the text of Receptus, it says, blessed are they that do his commandments. Now, it's a minor distinction, but here's the critical thing about it. If you follow the Textus Receptus, which is the, the more inaccurate one, it's the, it's the newer and more likely to be wrong one, you take Jesus out of being the speaker, and suddenly someone else is talking about Jesus in the third person. Blessed are they that do his commandments. And so a red-letter Bible would not have that in red letters. Does your Bible have wash the robes? Okay, yeah. So you, you have to make Jesus the object instead of the speaker. If you do that. But if you keep a text of Sinaiticus, it's still Jesus speaking, and it becomes Jesus as the speaker all the way to the very end of the book, making him the last speaker until John just says goodbye at the last line. So Jesus becomes the primary final speaker of the book, and it's not broken up by someone saying, you know, don't forget to do his commandments. No, it comes from the master himself saying, Blessed are they, you people who wash your robes. That's the that's the better translation of the text. So blessed are they that wash their robes so that they may have right to the tree of life. Now, it's two different translations, but don't nobody get, you know, your diapers in a bunch because it, it doesn't change the text. Doing his commandments in the context is washing their robes. It's, it's, that's not going to break the Bible. It's just someone forgot to dot an eye along the way. Blessed are they that wash their robes that they may have right to the tree of life and enter into the gates to the city that we're reading about here. But where is the tree of life? The tree of life is in the city. But what is the city? The city is the new Jerusalem, the church of Jesus Christ, chapter 21. It's coming from God out of heaven, the bride of the Lamb. The bride of Christ is the church of Christ, Ephesians 5. The holy city of Christ is the church of Christ. The tree of life is in the church of Christ. And this verse, this, this chapter, these chapters, nowhere does it say that the church of Christ does not currently have the tree of life, and when you get to heaven, you'll get it. That is not written in the Bible. What the Bible tells you is you, right now, as a member of the Church of Christ, have access right now to the Tree of Life. You, as a member of the Church of Christ, live forever. Because you get to eat from the spiritual fruit. You partake of the fruit of Jesus Christ. His spiritual body. 
you live forever with him. Your physical body will die, but what's that? It's just bones. Your spirit lives forever with him as long as you stay faithful and stay doing your work, washing your robes, washing, there's an O at the end of that verb, omega, washing your robes to stay faithful. Outside of the church of Christ, outside of the church of Christ, not the denomination as the people call it, outside of the kingdom of Jesus, verse 15, are dogs, sorcerers, whoremongers, murderers, idolaters, and anyone who loves to make a lie. Outside are those who are not in the, the, the fold, dogs, not in the sheepfold. Outside are those who are sorcerers, those who practice witchcraft, whoremongers, those who love the flesh over the spirit, idolaters, those who put creation over creator, lovers and makers of lies, those who are disloyal, because if you say I'll follow you till death and you don't, you made him yourself a liar because you said you would follow him. Verse 16, I, Jesus, he's still talking, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David. I am the bright and the morning star. Jesus speaking about an angel who has talked to John, who's written this letter that you're now reading. That's the first part. But it gets good at the last part of the verse where Jesus describes himself in two ways. I am the root and the offspring of David. I am the branch. I am the upshooting, as the Old Testament constantly calls him. I am the branch from the tree of David, the Messiah, and the bright and morning star. The bright and morning star. The morning star is Venus. I know it's not a star, but it looks like one. And Venus was, in antiquity, always known as the herald of the morning because Venus was a star that shines brightly just before dawn. And so to see Venus, to see that star, is to see and know a new day is about to dawn. Jesus says, I am the bringer of the new day. I am the one who's coming to give you a better hope. 17. And Jesus still speaking, and the spirit and the bride say, come. And let him that hears say, come. And let him that is thirsty, come. And whoever wants to, let him come take of the water of life freely. The spirit, God, and the bride, the church, invite those who are not yet partaking to partake. The spirit is the word preached. The bride is the word preacher. We use the word to do the preaching, telling people to come. All things are ready. Come to the feast. Come weary prodigal. Come. Come to Jesus. He will save you. I've wandered far away from God. Now I'm coming home. We sing those songs for a reason. So come take the water of life. Verse 18. For I testify unto every man that hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the plagues written in this book. So if you're getting all excited, seeing about all the ways that God's going to punish all these wicked people for all these doing these particular sins that they're doing, and you decide to get in on the action, and you think to yourself, you know, I also have a problem with someone doing this that God doesn't really care about, and you decide to condemn that, well, guess what? Those bowls of wrath are going to be dumped out on your head too. You don't get to condemn what God has not condemned. Verse 19. And if any man takes away from the words of the prophecy of this book, God will take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city, and the things that are written in this book. And if you read these prophecies, and you read these sins, and you read these crimes that people do that they get punished for, and you think, well, this one's out of style. This one's okay now. We can do this one now. Prepare to have your name removed. You want to take that one out? He's going to take your name out of the book of life. Ask a person who believes in once saved, always saved, if salvation means having their name written in the book of life. And ask them if they say yes, because they will. Ask them, does that, can you ever have your name taken out of the book of life? And if they say no, which they probably will, remind them that the master himself threatened it if you don't do what he says and stay faithful to him. And if you mess around with his book, he's erasing your name. Verse 20. This is Jesus still speaking in the third person about himself. He which testifies these things says, quote, surely I come quickly. And then John interjects and says, amen. Even so, come quickly. Amen, yes, so be it. High five, hurrah. But wait, that means judgment and punishment, the sin to the wicked will be destroyed. Even so, come Lord Jesus. Surely I, surely I come quickly. Certainly, take it to the bank. Surely I, I know the kids are done and I'm almost done. Surely I, Jesus, the one who matters, comes quickly. Surely I come. He came the first time. He can do it again. Surely I come. Lickety split. And then John says, amen. Even so, come. Verse 21, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you the faithful, the loyal, the true, the obedient, the workers in his kingdom forevermore. Well, I could say more, but I'm out of time. Revelation is an amazing book. I'm sorry I had to rush at the end of it, 
Hopefully, now that we're done with this class, hopefully you've gained something from it. If nothing else, hopefully you've learned the book can be understood, even if the teacher talks really fast. Okay, the kids are giving me funny looks, so that's the end of class. Next week, questions and answers.